We are Life Church Livonia. All right, good morning, Life Church Livonia. How is everyone today? It is so good to see you, and uh, I'm really excited about today. And so um, I'm also excited about Thanksgiving, I'm not going to lie. I love all the holidays, uh, but Thanksgiving is special to me because I love food, I love family, and I cannot wait to feast this week. And so I hope that you have uh, plans made and that you have a place you can go uh, to just really just uh, feel loved and feel a part of uh, God's family as well. And so we're in the middle of a series uh, right now, it's called Battlegrounds. And uh, last week, we, we kicked this off with an amazing sermon from a, uh, our, my friend and mentor, Kevin Butcher, as he talked about the love of God. But the, the question becomes, why? Why battlegrounds? What, what are we talking about here? And, and honestly, what, where this began is our desire to, not, to actually equip you as people to win battles in the various areas of our life where we often feel frustrated and defeated. And as we read God's word, as we, as we hear the words of Jesus, as we dig back into even the Old Testament, into the book of Deuteronomy, uh, we hear a call to love God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength. And, and so, so often what happens is we struggle to give over those areas to God. That, that we, we get really good at giving over our heart, but maybe our mind and our body is not given over. Or we're good at uh, disciplining our body, but our minds are a, a mess. Uh, or maybe our minds are kind of neat and orderly, but our hearts, we struggle to receive and to know the love of God. And so we want to help you to actually experience victory in those areas. And, and we know that if those are some of the areas that are most important that we abandon to the Lord, to, that as we be, begin this process of following Jesus, if we know that those are some of the key areas of our life, we also should be aware that those are going to be areas that we experience in an, an intense amount of warfare. I want you to imagine that, that there is a, a war going on and that your life is, is, uh, has battlegrounds on it. And that, uh, that when you come to know Jesus, that, that God begins to uh, plant flags in your life of saying, uh, this, 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 this young man is mine. This woman is, is mine. We, that I claim this life as my own. And beautiful things begin to happen. But there are still going to be areas of our life where we struggle. So we want to help you in those areas. And, and Kevin Butcher, as I said last week, kicked us off beautifully. If you didn't have a chance to be here last week for his sermon on the love of God, you've got to get to our website, lifechurchlivoni.org, and check it out in our latest messages. It is a powerful message. It's really his life message. He's been a pastor for most of his adult life, but this is the one message that God has said, you must tell everyone about the love of God. And so it, it wrecked us in a beautiful way and rebuilt us as we began to experience. Because what happens is if we're going to win the battle for our heart, if we're going to win the battle for our heart on that particular battleground, we have to get to a place where we uh, both understand and receive the love of God. The kind of love that Paul talks to the Ephesians about when he says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This is the love of God we talked about last week. This is how you win the battleground for your heart. But here's the truth. Exposure to the love of God, even receiving the love of God, begins a process in us. It, but it's just the beginning of a victorious life. It's merely the start to what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. And, and, and what I know is that, is that loving God and experiencing the love of God um, is vitally important and it is the start, but it, it isn't enough for us to win all the battles. It's not enough. We have to learn how to engage those battles. If the love of God and knowing the love of God and experiencing the love of God was enough, then as I read scripture and I look all the way back to the garden and I see what happened with Adam and Eve, they wouldn't have stumbled the way they did. You could argue that in that context, walking and talking with God, that no one had ever walked this earth who experienced the pure, raw, unfiltered love of God more than they did. And yet they fell to temptation. And yet they were deceived. And yet they lost a battle in that place. So the love of God is important. 
It is at the core of everything, but there's additional battles that must be fought. And I think that one of the most difficult for for many of us here in America is the battle that happens in this six inches of space. I think it's six inches. I tried to measure my head last night. You know how hard it is to measure your head? It's brutal. Some of you may have a big head. It's more like eight inches. And some of you might have a small head. Four, but it doesn't matter because this is where it happens. Between our ears and our brain and our mind, it's a brutal battleground. Brutal. Where we, we, we come to this place, we come to church, or we are at a friend's house, and, and we, we've, we've come to understand the love of God, and we're like, yes, that's what I needed. It's what my heart needed to know that God loves me unconditionally. But my brain is still out of control. My thoughts spin in ways that I don't want them to, and I can't seem to make it stop. Our mind is a battleground. And I think that a lot of us struggle in this way. In fact, I would argue that all of us have struggled with this in some capacity. That all of us long for peace, but what we often experience is war. We long for peace in our minds, in our thoughts, but we experience warfare inside of our own head. And sometimes we lose those battles. Going back into my own life, I can think of uh, many times where I've had battles in my brain and, and lots of times, honestly, where I had, I really experienced victory and I feel like uh, God really came in and, and met me in those places and I think that part of my growth as a human, as a, as a follower of Jesus, some of my most important growth happened uh, here in my head with how I thought, the way I processed things. But I can also think about times in my life where I lost those battles Times where the enemy clearly won in the way I was thinking. And as I was processing this week and thinking back over my own life, one situation in my life kept coming back over and over again because I think it's a a really good example of of the way that I, 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 I actually not only lost one battle, but numerous battles. And you can see the progression of the brokenness in my thinking. This happened at least 15 years ago. And I was uh, living in Alaska at the time and I was traveling with my family and we were on our way home to Alaska and we got stranded in Seattle. Terrible weather, planes are grounded. I have my two oldest kids with me. We are miserable. Uh, All of the hotels are booked. We have nowhere to go. One of the worst moments of travel I've ever had in my entire life. We have no idea, what are we gonna do? Uh, There is a hotel available, but it's so far away that we have no way to get there. And public transportation is on lockdown because there was ice on the roads. You couldn't even get a taxi. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in that, that spot where my brain is worrying. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And so what I did is I realized, oh my goodness, one of my students that used to be in my youth group in Alaska now lives in Seattle and he has a car. So I called him. It was late at night. Finals were the next day for him. And I said, I, I'm really sorry. I don't know what to do, but my family and I are stranded at the airport. Could you come and rescue us? And he did. Dropped what he was doing and he came and rescued us. It was beautiful. But the story, you would think that that's like the beautiful end of the story, but it's not even close. Because what happened is that on, uh, right as we got to where we were trying to go, just as we got to a safe spot, his car broke down. Like broke down, broke down. And now we're in a, a lobby of a strange hotel uh, with a broken down car and tow trucks are everywhere because there's ice on the road. And we're trying to get our, the next flight out and, and it's just not a good situation. And eventually what what happened is my family and I were able to get a flight. The shuttle bus from the hotel took us back to the airport so we could go. And we had to leave my friend there at the hotel waiting for a tow truck for his car. Flash forward a couple weeks, I get a phone call from him. And and I could tell that he was kind of upset. And there were repairs that were going to have to be done in his car. And and the, the tow wasn't covered by AAA for some reason. And so there was all these bills. And he called because he wanted me to pay for it. Now, right in that moment, I'm ashamed to admit this. The battle began in my brain. Like, it's not my responsibility to fix your car. Like, I'm really glad you came and picked me up. And that was really beautiful of you to do. And it really made a huge impact on my family that night. But it's not my fault that you didn't take care of your car, okay? 
and that you didn't do the repairs you need to earlier to prevent this big repair. And listen, I, you know, I'll have to think about that. That's what I said. I'll have to think about it. So I get off the phone and instead of getting on my knees and praying and saying, Lord, what would you have me do? Instead of asking the Holy Spirit to, to, to give me grace and wisdom and generosity for crying out loud, right? What did I do? I began to rehearse in my brain over and over again all the reasons why it didn't make sense for me to pay him anything. And the more I thought about it, the more angry I got. I was thinking about the sweet entertainment system he'd bought and the money I'd been seeing him spend frivolously over here and over here and how tight things were for us at home. And I, be, I, was, I got angry and I'm like, this is not right that he would even ask me for that. And I'm rehearsing all the things I'm gonna tell him. I'm gonna give him peace of my mind, right? And then I called him. And by the time I called him, I had already lost the first battle. Anger had won. I said stupid things. I said hurtful things. I said relationally damaging things in that conversation, all in the name of truth. Truth. And then I hung up the phone. The moment I hung up the phone, round two of the battle started. Round two wasn't an issue with anger. Uh, guess what round two was? It was an issue with shame. Brian, what did you do? You're a follower of Jesus, for crying out loud. You, you're a pastor, for crying out loud. What's wrong with you? Like, this isn't how you're supposed to act. And I began to, over and over again, circulate the, the memory of that event, rehearsing in my brain, like, what if I had said this differently? And maybe I didn't say it quite as harsh as I thought I did. Yeah, you did, Brian. You actually said it harsher than that. Don't try to candy coat it. And over and over again, my brain just spinning in this area of shame. And I'm in the midst of a battle. And so what do I do? What I should have done is I should have taken my failure, taken my shame, and brought it to Jesus. I should have brought it to the Lord and asked for forgiveness and received that forgiveness and called him immediately. But instead, I did nothing because my shame was crippling. And I lost round two of the battle. And then it moved into a, a new season. Now time is starting to tick by. Weeks have gone by. Months have gone by. And deep in my heart, I wanted to do the right thing. I wanted to call him and make things right. But now I'd gone into the third area of battle, which was the battle with fear. Well, what if I call him? What is he gonna say? How is he gonna respond? What if he still wants the money? <laughs> like, what is wrong with me? Why would he even think about that? And fear kicks in. Worry and anxiety and I'm losing the battle over and over and over again with anger and with shame and with fear. And I know there's many ways that, that you can get stuck in your brain, but I think anger and shame and fear are three of the primary ways that we get trapped. And the problem is that we don't know what to do with our anger and our shame and our fear when they come. We don't know what to do with them. And because we don't know what to do with them, they begin to spin out of control in our brain. And, and I'm sorry if this is too much for you, but this is the image that I get stuck in my head. Are you ready? That when you spin those negative things around in your brain over and over again, as you process your anger and over and over again, what happens? It deepens, doesn't it? It gets worse. It never makes it better, does it? When you, when you rehearse your failure over and over and over again in your brain, it doesn't get better. No, it gets worse. You feel deeper shame and more guilt over it. And the image I have in my brain for that, it's almost as bad, ready? As washing the toilet before you flush it. Right? Who does that? You, if, you wanna, if I send my kids up to wash the toilet and, there, and someone didn't flush, flush that junk before you, you smear it around. Some of you are like, I thought this was a safe place to come to church, but clearly it's not. Listen, this is what you do when you recirculate those negative thoughts. This is what we do when we recirculate our shame. We're just smearing junk, right? Flush it. We have to flush that stuff first out of our system. Why is it that we struggle with that so much? Uh, Romans 7.21 says, So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work with me. I become a prisoner. 
Because there's a war going on in my mind that sometimes I'm not even aware of. And God's love, it brought me into the family, right? God's love drew me in to relationship. But once we become family, there's still areas of our life that sometimes are, are not exposed to the light and love of Jesus. The love of God doesn't instantly penetrate to all of the broken places. It doesn't instantly cure all of the, the, the twisted pathways of our mind. And the devil works in those dark places. The devil still wants to lay claim to some of that territory in your brain. And so we find this law at work in us. We want to do the right thing. I want to make the phone call. I want to be generous. But my brain in those spaces hasn't been abandoned over to God yet. And so I recirculate the junk over and over and over again. I was a prisoner to my anger and my shame and my fear back then, and I didn't even know it. I couldn't have even articulated it to you. I was talking about this with Jamie last night, and I was reminding her of the story about how much I struggled with this. And she said, I don't even remember that happening. You know why she didn't remember it? Because it wasn't, no one could see it. The battle, the entire battle was fought right here. And I didn't even have the language to articulate what was going on, let alone fight it. It's critical that, that, we, that we actually come to a place where we learn to do the battle. And this is what I know to be true. I just want to speak grace over you. If you are new to following Jesus, that this is the truth, that we aren't brought into God's family as fully grown spiritual warriors. We come in as well-loved babies who have a lot to learn, Right? We come in as well-loved babies. God draws us into his family, but he wants to equip us to be full-grown spiritual warriors who know how to do this, this, these battles, who know how to win these fights in our mind. He wants to equip us for it. But before we'll experience victory in our minds, we have to recognize where the battles will be fought and learn how to fight those specific battles. Francis Frangipan wrote a book called The Three Battlegrounds. It's amazing. And I'm gonna quote him numerous times throughout the rest of the sermon, but I want you to hear what he said about this. He said, let us recognize before we do warfare, before we do warfare, this means before you get stuck or you're struggling, let us recognize that before we do warfare, that the areas we hide in darkness are the very areas of our future defeat. Often the battles we face will not cease until we discover and repent for the darkness that is within us. This is huge. Where are the places in our minds that we are still stuck? You've experienced the love of God. You've received the love of God, but where are the places that are still stuck? The first step to winning the battle in your mind, the very first thing you have to do is you have to identify the dark places. You have to identify the dark places. And sometimes you can figure this out on your own. Sometimes you can figure it out by talking to your, your best friend or to your spouse or to whoever knows you the best, your family. But I will tell you that nothing replaces asking God. Nothing replaces going before God in prayer and saying, Lord, help me to see the dark places in my life. Jesus, help me to see the places that, that I've received your love, but I still haven't given you authority and control over these parts of my thinking. We have to identify the places where we consistently struggle, the pathways that are so well-worn that we're not sure we can ever break free from. And so I know that there's more than anger, shame, and fear, but let's just focus in on those for a moment. Ask yourself these questions. Uh, do you get sucked into anger and frustration really easily? Finding yourself quickly annoyed with people or situations. Like you just go to anger. Like one moment everything's good and then the next thing someone says something, you're like, now nah, I'm mad. All right, here we go. And you give yourself permission to go there because that's just who you are. Do you do that? Maybe, maybe anger is a place where, uh, where you're stuck. Maybe it's a dark place that needs the light of God. Or maybe it's not anger. Maybe it's shame. Do you beat yourself up over all of your perceived deficiencies? Do you look in the mirror and see nothing but failure? Do you uh, regurgitate and, and chew on your, your struggles over and over and over again until your self-worth is reduced to almost nothing? Maybe this is the well-worn pathway of your mind and maybe it's still a dark place that the light of God needs to penetrate to. 
Do you slip into worry and fear effortlessly? Like the moment even something good happens, you're interest, instantly thinking about, well, but hold on. What if? And you're, you begin to worry and fret and fear over the future and, and you're, you're borrowing trouble from the future for today and you can never relax. Maybe this is a place where, that's still a dark spot in your brain. And here's what you need to know. The devil wants to keep you captive there. The devil wants to keep you stuck in those places with your anger and your shame and your fear. Because as long as he keeps you stuck in that place, he prevents you from living fully into who God made you to be. He wants to keep your anger inflamed. And not just keep it inflamed, he wants to throw gasoline on it. He, he, wants, to, he wants to ramp up your shame until it's crippling. He wants to take your, your fear and elevate it to the point where you can't do anything without worry and doubt. This is what he wants you to do. Because what, what, what the enemy does is he, is he takes our focus off what we should be focusing on, which is God, which is growth, which is love, which is mercy, which is grace, which is hope. And he takes our focus and he shifts it to all these other things. What happens when we allow anger to control our brain? What are we actually focusing on? Anger causes us to shift our focus to the offense or to the offender, right? All we can think about are, are the ways that that person harmed us, the way that person was rude to us, the way that person was wrong, right? Anger, it keeps us focused on the offense. It splits our mind between the Lord and the offender. It's not where our, our heart needs to be. It's not where our head needs to be. And shame does something different. What does shame do? Shame keeps us focused on our failure. Shame's like, none of the rest of that stuff matters because you, you, you struggle. You failed. You have deficiency. You don't have what it takes. You shouldn't have done that. That was a bad decision. You hurt that person. You failed that person. Shame keeps us focused on our failure. And fear, what does fear keep us focused on? It keeps us focused on our circumstances. We can't get our eyes off our circumstances. And so fear holds us captive. And all of this adds up. It brings us to a dark place where all that we have left is anger, shame, and fear. And the lights start to go out. Anger, shame, and fear. They become central in our brain. And the longer we spend them in our brain, the bigger they get. Anger, shame, and fear. And we, we have trouble seeing anything else in our life, right? Because we're rehearsing this in our brain. Anger, shame, and fear until we get to a spot where all we have, the only thing that exists in our brain is anger, shame, and fear, and the lights go out in our life. You feel this? This is what hopelessness feels like. This is what darkness and the futility of our thinking feels like. This is what happens when we forget how to do battle or we never learn how to do battle. We get stuck in that place where only anger and shame and fear live. So what do we do? What do we do in those moments? The only thing we can do to win this battle is to invite Jesus into the dark places and he turns the lights on. He starts revealing truth to you about who you are and who God called you to be. And slowly but surely, the lights turn back on in your life. And now you can see things, you can see things that are happening and you can see what's true and what's not true. And you can see the, the, the way that your mind has gotten things messed up and pulled you farther and farther away from God. We have to invite Jesus into the dark places so that God can destroy the plans of the devil because the plan of the devil is to keep you there. And God wants to come in with his light and his love and destroy the plans of the devil to change the patterns and habits of our mind, to break us free from those places. And when we invite Jesus into those places, 
what we do is we begin to humbly submit control over spaces that are well-worn paths. We say, Jesus, I've been thinking like this since I was two. Like I learned this shame in my living room from my parents. I learned this fear on the playground at school. I learned this anger by watching my dad and my grandpa. I've been practicing these things since I was a child. And right now, the devil holds claim to those places because I don't believe that anything could ever change. This is just who I am. We need to learn to humbly submit those places. And what happens when we submit the spaces in our heart that are dark to God? Listen to James 4, 7. Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Because he who is in us is stronger than he who is in the world. What does that mean? Maybe you're like, I've just come to church for the first time. I've never even heard that before. What it means is that God is stronger than the devil. God is stronger than your fear, than your anger, than your shame. His love is pen- can penetrate to the darkest and hardest places of your life and can do work there. If we are willing to partner with God and actually submit those places. Those darkest, hardest places, God doesn't take them by force. He takes them because he's invited. Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Here's here's what I want you to hear. When we submit ourselves to God and it says then resist the devil, it's not like, um, like I'm turning around and I'm the one fighting the devil that it's, it's actually our submission to God that causes us to resist the devil. It's God in us that creates a resistance to the devil. You cannot fight a spiritual battle with a human-made weapon. You can't. Only God can do this in your life, and you have to be willing to submit all that you are to God. Listen to what Francis, Fran Japan, says about this. Why does the devil flee? He says, Satan will not continue to assault you if the circumstances he designed to destroy you are now working to perfect you. You invite Jesus into those places. You submit those areas of your life to God and God begins to work on you and begins to refine you in those places. God begins to teach you things about life and about love through your situations that you're angry about. God begins to to bring you into this beautiful relationship and draw you out of your shame and give you self-worth and he's perfecting your own image of your life. And the Satan's like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Like I had you in that spot. Like shame was my jam in your life. That was my territory or fear. So now that tactic is no longer working and this is part of what causes the enemy to flee. Because what was originally used to, to, and to captivate you, to hold you prisoner, is now being used to perfect you and draw you deeper into the love of Jesus Christ. It no longer is working, and the devil begins to flee. And as we do that, as we begin that process, as we invite Jesus into the dark places of our life, the next thing we have to do is we have to allow the Holy Spirit to change our minds. I'm not just saying change our minds in the way that I'm like, I believe this one thing and now I believe another. That's important. We have to do that. But actually it's changing the way we think. To, to, to put blockades up so that road is no longer uh, something that you can even take. Over time, that you shut it down, you tear it up and you forge ahead on new pathways. As we submit those areas to God's control, it's like the light is turned on. And the love is penetrated and we can now for the very first time finally begin to see clearly. We finally, it's like when the lights came on earlier in the room. Did you feel it? It felt better, didn't it? I feel like you could like take a deep breath like, okay, the lights are back on. I hope I didn't freak anyone out. So what do we do? When we begin to to allow the Holy Spirit to change our mind and we begin to see things more clearly, we begin to believe the truth about our anger. We begin to believe the truth about our anger. What is the nature of anger? What is true about it? What is false about it? We, we begin to realize that not all anger is bad. In fact, there's some anger that's, that can, can be righteous. 
Anger over just things. It's not that anger itself is bad. It's what we do with that anger. It's how we live into it, how we respond to it, how we allow it to control us. Ephesians 4 says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry for anger gives a foothold to the devil. It says, don't let anger control you. And, and, and by the way, don't even let the sun go down on it because if you do, what happens? You're, it's spinning and it's rotting and it's controlling. Don't even let the sun go down because when you do, the devil starts to take that ground back. You give the devil a foothold. We begin to see the truth about our anger. We begin to hear the truth about our shame. Some of you need to hear truth about your shame. Some of you need to know that last week when Kevin was talking about the love of God, that that love covers a multitude of sins that you are known and loved and cherished just the way you are, but God won't leave you where you're at. And there's a huge difference between uh, shame and this, this messy, ugly shame that, that ruins our self-esteem and the kind of, 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 of guilt that comes when you're convicted that you've done something wrong. There's a difference we begin to hear the truth about that for the first time, that it's a good thing for me to feel convicted about my struggles, convicted. It was a good thing that I was convicted over my, uh, that I shouldn't have called that guy and spoken those harsh words. That conviction was good. But what I did with that conviction is I allowed it to tell me lies about myself instead of going before the Lord and saying, God, I'm so sorry I did that. That was really broken. Please forgive me. When we do that, it's called repenting. It's turning from our sin, turning from our failure, turning away from shame. We can begin to hear the truth about shame, that you are forgiven. When you bring those things to God, you are forgiven and it is done. We begin to believe Romans 8 when it says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. This is the truth of the gospel. This is why we exist here. Is that we get to come to God with all of our brokenness and all of our bad decisions and all of our twisted up thinking and all the ways that we've failed. We get to come to God and say, please forgive me. I give it all to you. And he says, done. And he means it. And then he has to remind us Hey, don't pick that back up. There is therefore now no condemnation. Your shame can be washed away in the light of God's love. And then we begin to receive the truth about our fear. Now, some fear is healthy, right? I'm kind of a, a, a dumb guy sometimes and I ha don't have as much fear as I should. That's how guys end up doing stupid things. Anyone that's had a boy or, or maybe a, 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 you know, a boy that has like, they're like, does, is their brain on right? And they run in and they do stuff. They jump off buildings and they try to lift things they shouldn't lift and they try to jump their dirt bike over a creek that there's no way they're gonna make, make it. Some fear is good, Right? What is the truth about fear though? Is that fear can't captivate us because if fear captivates us, it always creates a crisis of faith. Hear this. When we are captivated by fear, it always creates a crisis of faith because we get to a spot where we begin to ask the question, God, where are you? We're so twisted up in our thinking about our worry and about our fear and about our anxiety that we begin to question that God is even there. Like if God, if you were here, then why? This, this, and this. God, if you were here, then you would remove this, this, and this. And always, if fear captivates us, always at some point creates a crisis of faith. When we ask the question, where's God? Where is God in the midst of all of this? But we begin to receive the truth about fear when God takes that ground in our life and we begin to believe Romans 8, 35, that says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Who will set, what will separate us from the love of Christ? Will trouble or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, listen, any single one of these things, any single one of those things on that list could create anger, right? It could create shame. 
Think about nakedness. What is that about? Just about shame. It could create fear as you're, you're encountering danger and sword. Every single one of these could create opportunities for our mind to spin out of control. And we are reminded when we receive the truth about our fear that nothing will separate us from the love of God. And it goes on. It tells us, will all those things separate us? No. In all these things, we have complete victory through him who loved us. Complete victory. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor heavenly rulers, nor things that are present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He will give us victory. There's nothing that wasn't contained on that list. Do you get the idea here? The the drift that God is saying, nothing. Nothing. It couldn't be a more exhaustive list. They could have gone on and on and on. And some of you are probably thinking, but what about nothing will separate you from the love of God? Because you are called into a relationship where you can have complete victory. When we move beyond simply knowing God's love, We move beyond simply hearing about it at church from a gifted speaker like Kevin to allowing God's love to penetrate to the darkest places of our lives. And we begin to allow God to teach us how to have victory. This is huge. Going back to Francis, Fran Japan again, he says this. Victory begins with the name of Jesus on your lips but it will not be consummated until the nature of Jesus is in your heart. It takes time, friends. It's a process of regular acts of obedience, of hearing God say, I'm calling you to submit this area of your life and actually responding. So what I want you to know is that uh, we have someone in our church, and I think she's here, right? Okay. Janet Haddad, over the last months, God has been drawing her closer and closer and closer to himself. She's heard about the love of God, received the love of God, and God has begun transforming her at the core of her being. And, and she knows that there's places in her life that, that, that are, there's still darkness there. She wants God to, to get in there and bring his light and his love and penetrate to the depths of who she is. And as we've been talking about what it looks like to submit our lives to the Lord, uh, she calls me and she says, uh, she says, Pastor Brian, I, I really believe that I'm supposed to get baptized. I really believe that this is an act of submission to the will of God for my life, that I am called to get baptized. And let me explain to you what baptism is if if you're not familiar. Baptism is simply an uh, an outward sign of an inward reality where God mysteriously meets us in that space and the Holy Spirit works in powerful ways and we declare, my life is God's. My life is God's, not the devil's. My life is God's. So she came to me after first service today and said, do we have to wait? Do we have to wait for me to be baptized? And you know what happened? You ready? I got stuck in my mind for a minute. This is object lesson number 152. I began to think of all the reasons why that wouldn't work. Seriously. All the, the fear about what would happen if I did it wrong or if, we, uh, if not, people weren't able to be here or is she gonna be able to get this? Do we even have towels? Is there, where's, our bab, do we, our, where's our baptism tank? And I'm spinning. Deep breath. Jesus, what would you have us do? Go get the baptismal tank out of the, out of the truck. Fill it up. Call her family and invite her forward. You guys Ready? Yeah, where's she at? Where's Janet at? Janet, here she is. Come on over. So I want to ask you a couple questions first. Y'all ready for a baptism? So here's, here's what God does. He meets a person, he loves that person, and he changes that person. Amen? Amen. And so uh, what we just ask uh, is that, is we ask Janet, have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. 
And do you declare that today that your life is not your own, that is now Jesus Christ's? Yes, sir. Amen. Do you submit all the dark places and the hard places to his authority? Yes. Are you ready to be baptized? Yes. All right, you guys ready? Yes. All right. Okay, you take, take your glasses. glasses <laughs> yeah. Just step in. Yeah. And you can. It's nice and warm. We love our people enough to warm the water. <laughs> Scooch on forward. And then I'm just going to have you cross your arms. Sit down. Ready? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Woo! Cross your arms and plug your nose. All right. So, Janet, I baptize you now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray for her. Who wants to come in and pray? Step out right over here, Janet. Here we go. This way, back on the towels. Right? All right. Get in here. Put your hands on her. David. Father, we lift up your name, Lord, because you are awesome. Mm. We thank you, Lord, for the amazing things you do for us, Lord, the amazing things you do for us and in us. Yes. Lord, Lord. I have watched how you changed Janet's life um, since I was a believer myself. And until now, Lord, nobody can do the works that you do. And when I see a person like my sister Janet change mm. and, and, and invite you in their lives, I can see the change, Lord. And only mm. you can do that change. And we lift up your name. Absolutely. We praise you for that, Lord. And I yes, pray Lord. that you would continue your work in her, Lord. Mm-hmm. I pray you do not stop the work of your hands with her. And I mm. pray you guide her yes. with your spirit and righteousness and truth, Lord, and make her a bright light for your kingdom mm. that all may see. Your glory and your purpose. Yes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. Amen. Give it up. Woo. So I just got to tell you, victory can be had in Jesus. Victory can be had in Jesus. And and what just happened with Janet, I want you to know that people are regularly finding freedom here at this place. That over 30 people this year have committed their life to follow the Lord in this place. That's huge. That's why we do what we do. That's why we make you those, those cards that have our series on it. Not so you can throw them away. Not so you can put them on your refrigerator. So you can take them and give them to a sibling or a coworker or the barista at your favorite coffee shop. Like David said, inviting his sister, David Haddad, inviting his sister to our church. And she comes and she experiences life in Christ here because of an invitation. This is who we are to God made us to be. And the question that I have for you, are you ready to step into the first beginning parts of your journey to becoming a spiritual warrior where you can win the battle in your mind? Are you ready to ask the question to the Holy Spirit, where are the dark places in my life, God? Where are those at? It's scary. I'm telling you, it's scary. And when you identify those places, are you willing to say to Jesus, come, sit with me in this place? Because Jesus, I can't do this on my own. There's no way that I can win this battle without you coming into the dark places. And he comes and he sits with us and he loves us in that space. And then he, he gra- grabs my hand and he grabs your hand in the midst of our shame and fear and anger. And he says, let's go. There's a new way. And he slowly begins to pull you out of that old space. And everywhere he walks in your mind, he leaves his footprints of his love and his grace and his hope, and he claims the land. I want to pray for you. If you're in a place where you're far from God, this prayer is for you. Maybe it's time for you to make a commitment to Christ just like Janet did. Or maybe it's time for you to ask the question, where are the dark places? Let's pray.
So Jesus, we just give you this, this moment right now. There, this is a holy space, a sacred space where your love has been made known in a tangible way, God. And I pray that if there are people here that are far from you right now, that long to be in a relationship with you, that long to know and receive your love, that they would simply right now in the quiet of their hearts say, Jesus, I commit my journey to you. I commit my life to you. Shower me with your love. Fill me with your love. Forgive me of all the things I've done that are broken. I commit myself to you, God. If you're in a place where you know, you've know you known God's love for most of your life, but you know that you have many dark places where the battle has not been won in your mind, then right now I just invite you, uh, I just encourage you to say to the Lord, reveal to me those places that are dark. And don't sit there in that darkness alone, but then in that same moment you say, Jesus, I see that spot. I see that hurt. I see that anger. I see that shame. I see my fear. And will you come and be there with me? Show me the way. Because I believe you are the way and the truth and the life. We love you, Jesus. That's why we're here. Now as our worship rises up, as our hearts rise up to you, continue to do miracles in the space. In the name of Jesus, we pray.